This is uh, Lacey Stein. I've only met a handful of you, sadly. I'm hoping to meet much more. Uh, I'm the Census Outreach Coordinator for um, CCDC, as you know. Um, and I am new to this position and new to CCDC. But I have been um, with nonprofits uh, in a variety of roles. I've done research with nonprofits, um, served on board of directors, all kinds of uh, all kinds of different hats that I have worn since 2004. Um, uh, all here in the Denver area. Um, some of the programs that I was with, though, um, were uh, you know uh, statewide programs. So um, I am loving CCDC. What an incredible group of people! Um, and I am. I, I was admittedly. Uh, really excited to work for CCDC and get my toes further into um, the world of disability. I do have a, a background in mental health, um, but uh, yeah, I, I wasn't all that excited about census work, honestly. Um, I, I thought it was important, but not necessarily interesting. And I have been shocked at just how interesting it actually is. Um, not to mention, not, not just important, but crucial. So um, I really hope that you all come away today uh, feeling at least somewhat the same as I do. Um, so today's goal is essentially, yeah, to equip you with census knowledge and tools to help support you and to encourage your neighbors, your organizational partners, your networks, your stakeholders, whatever the case might be, to participate in the upcoming 2020 census. Um, so specifically, we're gonna look at the basics of the census, right? Like the things that you might anticipate. So who, what, where, when, why, and how of participation. I will spend a significant amount of time on um, uh, going through some of the specifics um, as they relate to the co-populations that you might be connected to, um, working with, all of that. I've tried to dance a, a, a fine line here um, in that I recognize that um, uh, some of you all are just joining for, um, you know, your own personal benefit. Some are hoping to do outreach. Some are, um, you know, hoping to just encourage community members to participate. And we are all working with, you know, even though we are all clearly connected to communities impacted by disability, we are all working with a really wide range of, of folks, right? Um, so I'm trying to relay a lot of general information and then specific information somehow simultaneously in a short period of time. So we'll, we'll see. Um, and uh, then I am going to try to leave some time for uh, Q&A. Um, and then I will also be following up in the coming days I'll, uh, with, like I said, the recording of this webinar. I'm going to check into getting it um, uh, closed captioned to see if that's possible as well. Um, and uh, yeah, and then I'm going to follow up with a packet of resources so that you guys can use those um, uh, as you see fit. And uh, we can talk a little bit more about it later, but let me just say right now that the resources that are made available um, are <laughs> simply overwhelming. You could spend days in our resources. So if you are looking for something in particular that I do not cover today, I, I bet that it's out there and I'm more than happy to help you find it. So um, any questions before I jump in further? No? Okay. All right. So um, some requests from me so that I can hopefully, you know, be the best facilitator possible. Um, if it's okay, um, uh, if it's possible, uh, you might consider putting your device on mute just because I am easily distracted. Um, but having said that, like, you know, I'm, I'm not going to hold it against you, right? So um, I also do encourage questions. Um, but I let me let me reframe what's on the screen here. Um, I would appreciate like if you have any like big questions, like you know I am doing outreach with community A, B, or C. Um, if you could maybe hold on to those like larger questions um, 
until the end, that might be beneficial because I'm hoping that, you know, I'll be addressing some of the burning questions you all might have as we go through the information I've prepared. Um, and then, of course, you know, there will be time at the end and, and you can contact me. And I'll keep reiterating this. You can contact me anytime. This is my job. I am happy to help you if you are stumped or um, trying to develop a resource for your community. Um, so, and then, uh, but having said that, yeah, particularly if you have any kind of visual impairment, um, I have done, um, a, I hope a decent job of making this uh, presentation accessible to you. Um, but it's also like, um, just in general, if you have questions uh, and need clarification about something that you need, yeah, of course, please feel free and, um, uh, you know, pipe in, right? So that I'm being clear. Um, it is a little weird. I've been a, uh, <laughs> I've been teaching in college classrooms off and on for over a decade, but it is kind of strange just talking to a screen. So uh, it's weird not having that feedback. Anyway, um, so okay, uh, let's go ahead and jump in. Um, yeah, all right, let's go. Um, so let's start off with just some key names to know, and um, I could also say these are good resources, right? So here we obviously have the Census Bureau, right? Um, they are the ones that are officially conducting the census count, and they have been uh, creating and utilizing tons of partnerships both in Colorado and, you know, everywhere else, right? Like all the other states as well. Um, over here, we have Everyone Counts, which is um, affiliated or I guess the, um, the, the branding, the marketing for the Colorado Department of Local Affairs. Um, so they are the folks that conduct the um, and whole, host the Complete Count Committee. Um, and they are the ones who are, um, you know, technically signing my paycheck right now, I guess. Um, so that's where CCDC got our um, state census grant money. And uh, I believe that they awarded something, uh, don't quote me on this, but I believe something like 60 organizations throughout the state of Colorado um, to do work similar to um, what we are doing here at CCDC. Then obviously you've got um, the Colorado Cross Disability Coalition, your host for the day, right? Um, and so we are conducting census outreach with people who are impacted um, by the spectrum of disabilities, right? To ensure that they participate in the count. Um, in case this is interesting to you or you think that we should combine forces, um, we are and I am uh, in my specific role, really reaching out to folks who are transient, um, experiencing homelessness, uh, unsheltered people, um, because so frequently, um, you know, they also have um, any number of medical conditions or um, uh, what could be considered a disability. Um, we are also reaching out to a lot of seniors. So these are all hard to count populations and we'll talk more about that later. Um, and when I say hard to count, I mean like, you know, in quotations, right? Hard to count um, people when it comes to the census. Um, so just a little bit more background on, on who I am and what we're doing over here. And then last but not least, together we count. I am in love with these people. Um, they are specifically a 501c3 organization who are supporting other um, 501c3s and helping to make sure that hard to count uh, communities are counted. Um, they are doing a ton of work and have been preparing for this process for years and I also need to give them a particular shout out because a lot of the information and slides that I have here um, uh, I borrowed from them um, so and they are completely open to that, by the way. So pretty much all of the sources that we have on here, um, particularly these three, um, well, these three on their websites, right? The Census Bureau, Everyone Counts, and Together We Count have a ton of resources just very readily available and that are open source that anybody can use um, depending on how you want to be talking with your community members about the census. Um, likewise, of course, here we are over here, The um, uh, CCDC. Um, so we don't have that information on our website, but basically I am the go-to person there, right? So if you don't have time to do your own homework or are looking for something specific, I have been, um, yeah, really steeped in all of the resources that these three folks provide. Um, so again, contact me and I can help you do your legwork. All right. 
moving right along. So let's start with the basics, right? Um, so what is the census? <laughs> For some of you, this might seem really obvious, but the more people I have worked with and the more people I have talked to, like, I, I believe that because it only happens once, uh, you know, once every 10 years, there's just not a lot of information. People forget to put it on their radar, right? Um, and I don't mean like, there's not like one specific population that seems to be a little um, in the dark on this. I've talked to, you know, you, you name a, a demographic, a demographic of people. And I have heard people, um, you know, either, um, um, provide misinformation, right, that they've heard, or um, just say that they don't really know, or they don't really remember, or, or whatever, right? Um, so, simply put, the census is a survey conducted every 10 years by the U.S. Census Bureau. Oh, and I'm so sorry, let me pause for just a moment. Um, for anyone who might be visually impaired, I will be doing uh, a lot of reading from the slides, um, just so you know. Uh, keep that in mind. Um, yeah, moving forward. Okay, sorry about that. All right, so, uh, and then secondly, the goal of the census is really to just gather an accurate count of all people residing, and that word residing is significant, we'll get there momentarily, but of all people residing in the US. So that's really all it is. Um, it is 10 questions, and they anticipate that it takes about 10 minutes uh, to complete. Um, and that does kind of depend on the person and the household and all of that, right? Um, some people you might see messaging that says like, oh, 10 minutes per person. Um, in my experience, I think that I could have filled it out for my family of three in maybe 15 minutes, right? Um, so something to keep in mind as well. Um, okay. So let's talk about what the census is not before we move on. And then here in just a few minutes, I'll go through all kinds of um, uh, more nuanced situations, right? So we'll talk about the actual questions that are gonna be on there, um, the timeline, and then how people take it. So we'll, we're gonna be spending a lot of time talking about the different options for people taking it. And again, um, um, as I said a few moments ago, we'll spend a fair amount of time looking at different populations because um, the majority of us, I presume, my understanding is the majority of the people who are going to be listening to this webinar are uh, really trying to connect with those, um, again, hard to count, uh, quote unquote, populations. So um, the census is not, <laughs> let's talk about what the census is not real quick, um, based on a lot of the misinformation that's gone around and then my own experience doing outreach, you know, on the streets of Denver for the last month. So the census is not the American Community Survey. And you can see this is a hyperlink. Um, you're welcome to use this. Once again, I just got it off the Census Bureau website. Um, I had never even heard of the American Community Survey. Um, However, I figured this out. Um, well, I'll, I'll skip that story. Never mind. Um, I figured out that this is actually creating a lot of um, of uh, misinformation and confusion. Um, I don't know if the census might be putting out some, you know, like ads and things to try and clarify this. But basically, the American Community Survey is something that the Census Bureau conducts every single year, and my understanding is that it supplements the um the the every you know the, the excuse me the census that only takes place every decade right um the american community survey is way more complex way more complex and way more involved and takes a lot more time so obviously this is a webinar about the census not the american community survey but i do have the um the hyperlink here oh <laughs> and obviously you guys will be getting this <laughs> so that you can have access to the hyperlinks sorry about that um i will be sending this to you you know soon um so but yeah you can take a look at that just in case it will help um, just in case uh, it can help to cut down on some confusion so a lot of the time I start talking to people out on the streets in front of thrift stores or whatever um, where I'm kind of stationed to do my on foot outreach and um, people will be like I already took that I already took the census but then we start talking and we figure out that no this is what they took um, and yes people might have taken this uh, I believe that it's um, maybe 4 million people that are selected at random each year to fill this out. And I, my, my understanding is that it supplements um, the census information because, you know, obviously a whole lot changes in this, um, in this uh, um, 
time in history, right? Every 10 years. Um, so yes, this helps to supplement the census is much more complicated. And I believe that people have had Census Bureau workers come and do this like with them in their homes, right? So just to cut down on misinformation, confusion, and even if they took it in 2019 or I don't know if one has come out in 2020, considering we're still so uh, early on in the year. But regardless of if they've taken it uh, even very recently, that does not um, exempt, uh, exempt them from taking the 2020 census, which is much simpler if you need to reassure them. Does that make sense? Anybody have any questions about that? Again, I did not know that that existed until I started having people tell me, um, I already took the census. I'm like, no, that's literally impossible. That's either a fraud or there's something else going on. And this, it's not a fraud generally is what I'm finding. It's, it's this. So um, other, oops, excuse me, sorry. Um, other misinformation that is flying around and that we can only assume um, considering our uh, political and cultural climate and all of that right now. Um, so yeah, misinformation. Um, the census does not make individual information vulnerable. We'll talk about that further on down. I have a whole section um, for you all on safety and security. This does not make um, individual information vulnerable. The census does not ask for money. <laughs> no way, shape or form does money ever come into play. Um, if anybody does ask for money, you know right there that they are not an actual Census Bureau worker. Um, similarly, the social security number, nope. Nobody is ever gonna ask for that. Um, that is simply just not, um, not, that should not be encountered at all. If this is the actual census that people are uh, participating in, there's no question about social security number. Um, and then this does not threaten undocumented people in any way. Similarly, or to piggyback off that, it also does not any, it does not involve any kind of law enforcement agents. So if some, if a census worker comes knocking on somebody's door, um, it will simply be that Census Bureau worker. They will not be accompanied by a police officer or um, an ICE agent, for example. So um, again, we'll talk a little bit more about that on down the way, um, but I just wanted to be really clear and upfront about what the census does not do. Okay, so um, getting into the nitty gritty here. So why is this important? Um, again, I like I said, um, I knew this was important. I did not know that it is like, again, it is crucial. Like important is an understatement, it is crucial um, for our understanding and for um, uh, <laughs> our quality of life as Coloradans, particularly folks with disabilities um, for the next 10 years, right? Um, so on the face of it, right, it provides just a population baseline for the country, right? Um, it is a breakdown of the population by age, race, ethnicity, income. And then we get into more, you know, that's just some basic understandings, but now we can move into the more consequential aspects of it. So um, one little tidbit that I thought would be interesting, it does influence where businesses will be located. Um, turns out that lots of businesses use the information that is, um, uh, called from the census to decide whether or not they should open a business in somebody's neighborhood, right? So in terms of quality of life and uh, availability of products and services, um, that is very important. And then climbing on the ladder, I think, of importance then, right? It informs how many representative Colorado gets in Congress. Obviously, that is huge. <laughs> um, again, we'll talk more about that in just a moment. It informs representation at the city slash local levels. Um, uh, so we, again, talk about that in just a moment. Um, but yes, yeah, so the uh, city council district lines are drawn along the information that is gathered from the census data. And then at least in my mind, so though these points might be more important to you, um, about representation or even about businesses or something, right? Um, depending on who you're working with and what your concerns are in your community. Um, but for my own purposes, um, this is what has been the most important piece for me, this final note, which is um, in terms of folks with disabilities and the folks that CCDC is doing outreach, outreach with, um, the census determines how federal funding per 
excuse me, <laughs> determines how federal funding for public services is allocated. So we're gonna talk about that um, a fair amount as well. Any questions right now? How are we doing? Okay, cool. Um, all right, so yeah, let's talk about representation for just a moment. Um, again, not necessarily my uh, greatest area of expertise, um, just because of the own, like the, the lens that I, um, am you know seeing through as I'm doing my own outreach work um, but anybody who has questions about this again I'm happy to help with legwork or messaging or whatever the case might be if you think that representation is particularly relevant and um, Im important and could be very persuasive for people in your um, uh, communities so um, right the census numbers are directly tied to congressional representation and so here we have a map um uh we have a map of the u.s and it shows um how many representatives every state currently has uh based on the 20 uh excuse me the 2010 um census results and then depending on if it's you know if it's purple or beige or light green or brighter green um then these are the the um this is how the states are anticipating um, uh, representation shifts based on the 2020 census. So Colorado is in line, they believe, um, to gain one seat in the House of Representatives. Uh, you'll notice that California though, for example, is purple and they are um, potentially going to be losing a seat um, uh, in the House of Representatives. And so um, I wish I could remember the, the dollar amount, but I guess that, that uh, California is spending like millions of dollars on encouraging people to take the census to ensure that they are not undercounted, right? Um, and again, this is uh, just based on population. So it does not, I, I will reiterate this many times, it does not matter who you are, you can be one day old, you can be a hundred years old, you can be any color of the rainbow, any um, biological sex, anything, right? Uh, and it's just, um, the funding is based simply on the number of people who are counted in each state. Let me make that abundantly clear and I'll keep making it clear, right? Um, so if you go undercounted, then that's just the deal. You go undercounted, you lose money and you potentially lose uh, representation at the federal level, okay? Um, in terms of the local level, um, right here on this slide, I have, I hope that the alt text is clear for those of you who might um, like that. Uh, so this is, um, a map on the left, we've got two maps here, one on the left, one on the right. Um, the one on the left shows how city council lines were, uh, district lines were drawn according to the 2000 census. And then the, oh, excuse me, sorry. Uh, the um, map on the right shows how they were redrawn according to the 2010 uh, census information. So you can see, and again, I am, I am not an expert here, but I'm happy to help find answers if, uh, if you would like some, right? Um, but you can see here, like, let's just look up here at the northeast corner, right over here where um, Green Valley Ranch and DIA and all of that, right? Here would be, I believe, this is Stapleton up in here, right? Or wait, no, maybe this is Stapleton. I think this might be Hmm, sorry. See, I told you I'm not an expert. Um, <laughs> but the thing that's interesting to me here um, is the fact that, you know, if you look just at 8 and 11 in this upper right hand corner, you can see just these major shifts, right? Um, again, you look at 3 over here. Um, I believe that's is that over by like Sloan's Lake. This might be Sloan's Lake. Um, so, but you can see like 9 on the left uh, shrunk considerably right? Um, 10, which is closer to downtown. I think that's interesting that it stayed relatively the same. Um, but I'm really curious to see what this map looks like based on the 2020 um, census results, um, considering the ridiculous amount of boom we have had, at least here in Denver, um, and you know, somewhat throughout Colorado um, uh, since uh, the 2010 census. So any questions there before we start talking about uh, some of the public services? Okay, so again, I mean, it all depends on what your interests are. Um, 
uh, and what is important to your community and uh, in terms of representation. Um, but here is some information that, again, you can feel free to um, share with your communities if this is relevant to them and you think would persuade them to participate in the 2020 census. Okay. So yeah, now let's take a look at the 55 public services that receive federal funding based on census data. This is a very ugly screenshot <laughs> and I apologize for that. Um, I really wanted to um, demonstrate just how big and important this is. And unfortunately, right up here where it says counting for dollars uh, .pdf, um, this was the only way that my computer would let me take a screenshot, so it cuts off the uh, the titles, right, the, the headings that would be located underneath this little banner. Um, I can definitely, uh, this is actually, if you Google um, Counting for Dollars Colorado, this will pop up for you. Uh, this is the second page in a two-page document, um, but essentially what we're looking at here is, when I saw this, this is, I think, one of the first times that my mind got truly blown by just how, again, crucial the census is. So this is um, a look at our budget for fiscal year 2016, and it shows how all of um, these public services uh, were allocated funding. Again, all of the funding information and those decisions influenced by the 2010 um, census data. So um, just real quickly, uh, to go over a handful that are particularly relevant to my outreach and potentially your communities as well. We've got Medicaid right here, right? Five billion dollars allotted to Medicaid. It should have been a lot more, but we'll get to that in just a moment. Um, we've got all kinds of education stuff, right? So direct student loans. Um, here's SNAP, Medicare, Highway Planning and Construction, Pell Grants, Section 8 Housing Choice Vouchers, um, TAMF, right, Temporary Assistance for Needy Families, Very Low to Moderate Income Housing Loans, um, uh oh, my little arrow just disappeared, there we go, uh, CHIP for kids, um, the National School Lunch Programs, their Special Education, Section 8 Housing Assistant Payments Program, the list goes on and on, Federal Transit, also huge, right? Clearly, I've been doing a little bit of outreach on the buses, and this is something that I, uh, here in Denver, that I really um, talk about and push. Um, Head Start, WIC, uh, it's, it's everything we need, right? So regardless, I just, I want to just draw your attention, right? If you are working, um, if you're listening to this podcast, podcast if you're listening to this webinar and you are working in remote areas right there are lots and lots of different um uh um excuse me uh programs for rural communities we've got the electrification loans and loan guarantees water and waste disposal systems for rural communities uh rural rental assistance um down here we have native american employment and training um, so yeah, the list goes on and on. I will not, um, I will not read all 55 to you, but just amazing how significant this is. Um, so yeah, any questions or comments about this? Considering we're looking at an awful lot of information on this one little slide. Okay, great. Um, so let me see here. Uh, actually, let's back up. If you could see this that's hidden right here under this banner, it would show you that, by the way, and this will come into play in a moment, um, that uh, during fiscal year 2016, we were working as a state um, with $13 billion. That was the budget, right? But as we will talk about in just a moment, it could have been so much more. It could have been so much more. Um, so, some significant numbers to try and break some of this down for everybody. Um, excuse me, I'm drinking water. My throat gets awfully dry when I'm doing this stuff. Um, <laughs> okay, sorry. Um, so some numbers that I like to uh, share with people because they're quick and easy, you know, elevator speech style um, when I'm doing outreach. So every single person, again, a brand new baby that was born yesterday, a person who is 100 years old and living in hospice, um, everybody in between, no matter their race, no matter their citizenship status, every single person who is counted in the census earns about $2,300 per year for those public services that we just went over 
every year for the next decade. That's $23,000 per person between now and 2030. So $23,000, I mean, it's a good chunk of money. It um, maybe doesn't sound like um, that much, maybe, right? Depending on the person you're talking to, it sounds like a heck of a lot of money to me, but let's look at some more numbers here. So, um, <laughs> but it adds up, right? It adds up. Uh, so if even 1% of our, oops, there's a little misprint right there, sorry, of Colorado's population or our population goes uncounted, that is a loss of $63 million over the course of the next decade. That's just 1%. And they anticipate that certainly it will be more than 1%. They're guessing maybe like three to five, right? So let's do the math. So are we looking at more like $100 million? Are we looking more at like $300 million that we could have over the course of the next decade, but we're not gonna get because people are hesitant to take the um, census. They don't have access to it, right? They don't understand the importance, that kind of thing. So that is why this is so important. And then just uh, another little uh, snippet of important um, information slash significant numbers to help us understand the significance of the census, right? So we know based on, um, I cannot think of the name of the agency right now, but I've got it pulled up on my laptop. So if anybody wants this, let me know and I can send it to them. But uh, in a study that was conducted by um, this agency, whose name I cannot think of, um, uh, they looked at 15 of Colorado's 64 counties um, in terms of the 2010 census. And those 15 uh, counties were in the more rural areas, right? Um, but in those 15 counties, they know um, for sure, I don't know how they know for sure, but they, they are reporting that 538,533 people did not respond to the 2010 census. Um, the breakdown actually like came to, uh, they looked at family households and according to those statistics, it said that between 25 and 50% of all households did not participate. So that's a lot, right? Like, so undercounting will happen across the state, but obviously, and we'll talk more about this in a moment, there are challenges, right? Depending on whether you're in an urban area or a rural area or living on a reservation, so on and so forth, right? So in these rural areas, 25 to 50% did not get counted. Um, so that is more than, if we did the math correctly, like 1.2, maybe that should say million, sorry. Uh, <laughs> it's a lot of money that we missed out on. Now I'm wanting to redo the math. Anyway, I wish I could see your faces right now. Okay, uh, so <laughs> there's a reason I went into social sciences and not mathematics. All right, um, moving right along. So before we move along, any any questions? Anything, anything, anything? Let me see if there's any, okay, all right, cool. Okay, so who needs to be counted? everybody <laughs> in case i haven't made that clear every single person needs to be counted right um and again we'll talk a little more detail here in a few minutes but everyone counts everyone should be counted right every single person earns that twenty three hundred dollars a year for colorado all right so let's talk about how people can complete the census. This is where it starts to get pretty hairy. And so, um, yeah, <laughs> feel free to follow up questions. This is where, if you haven't already, you know, feel free to start jotting down questions that you might want to pose later um, or things that, you know, again, I'm available if you want to talk on the phone or um, via email or whatever, right? Uh, so yeah, there's just a lot of considerations when you're dealing with so many different kinds of lives and residences and people, um, right, uh, <coughs> um, for the census. So, okay, um, people can, for the first time ever, respond in these three different ways. I believe that in 2010 you could do the phone, um, but for sure online was not available. So you can respond uh, in paper form, over the telephone, or online. So um, in paper form, there will be um, guides available uh, in braille and large print forms. 
there's not a ton of information and I will talk about that again in just a second because it's really frustrating. Um, but uh, there's not nearly as much information as I would like available about what that's going to look like, but I did include um, the website here that you guys will have access to um, where you can find this information, right? Um, so I'll, I'll speak more to that in just a moment. Um, and print versions are also going to be available in English and Spanish. Over the telephone, it can be taken over any telephone, which I think is particularly important for folks living um, in areas with uh, not so great or zero internet access. So this can be a cell phone or a landline. There will also be a telephone device for people who are deaf or um, hearing impaired that will be available. And then on, well, no, let's uh, stick to those. So one thing that is really frustrating to me right now is that the census is not sharing information thus far about what the phone number is that you can call. <laughs> so again, I'm working with a lot of transient folks and trying to do outreach with them. And, um, uh, you know, many of which are, are struggling with mental health problems um, physical health problems, all of that, right? Um, and it really frustrates me that right now all I can do is say, you can take it over the phone. I see that you're holding a telephone, you know, a cell phone. You can take it over the phone. Um, and I can't tell them what number to call. So uh, my understanding is that it's for security purposes, which totally makes great sense. But I think that for those of us who are doing outreach, that's a real, um, it's a real thorn in our side right now. So we'll talk about the, the timeline right now uh, in a few minutes um, to discuss when we might have better access to that information. But you know, similarly, if you are needing a form in Braille, um, I would like to be able to give you that information now as opposed to two weeks from now or whatever, right? Um, so that is that is frustrating. Um, but uh, we will we will get there. Um, and feel free to contact me once again in, you know we've got about three weeks until all this goes live. Um, and I can happily also send out, uh, we will be sending out, you know, email blasts and things like that. Um, once we have this extremely important information um, to be able to send to you all. So moving on to point number three on the slide um, online. So online surveys, um, and this might be very important to some of you, depending on your communities, Online surveys will be available in the 13 most commonly spoken languages in the US. The tricky part is, and this is again something that I only know a little bit about because um, most of the folks that I'm working with are English speakers. Um, uh, so, but for uh, unfortunately, the 13 most commonly spoken languages in the US don't necessarily align with the 13 most commonly spoken languages in Colorado, right? Um, so having said that, there are guides available online in 59 different languages. I believe too that this is, uh, again, feel free to email me, um, but I believe that there are um, a variety of services, you know, in Aurora, for example, who are um, um, a variety of services who are working with people uh, to help them complete the census. Um, so yeah, um, so good news, but obviously still there are many challenges for um, uh, lots of folks. I, I'm excited about the number of options, but there are still plenty of challenges. Any questions before I move on to the next slide? Lacey, are you able to see the one in the chat from Marlene? Oh, okay. There we go. I was wondering about this. Aha, there we go. Chat, there we go. Oh, that's a really good question. Okay, oh, I'm loving all of your comments. Thank you guys. Um, so, um, so Marlene says, where does the $23 million come per person? Where does it go and what happens to the missed dollars? That is something I don't know, but I am going to Thank you. I'm going to uh, definitely keep track of that then. I'll, I'll track that down for you. I've been wondering the same thing, like what happens when so, the money doesn't get used? I think um, I could probably speak to that. Oh yeah, please. So the 23 million actually comes, obviously these are all federal dollars. So when we look at the federal budget, this is where the money comes from. Um, and, and so where does it go? The money actually goes into the state coffers. 
And so, as Lacey said, you could see on the one slide that she had all of the different programs and each state has different programs that would receive that federal funding. Um, so whether it's into the schools or into, um, like she said, SNAP and daycare and I mean, all of the different programs, it goes into those systems. Um, but it obviously comes directly into the state first. Mm -hmm. Um, and what happens when we don't get the money? We just don't get the money. It just stays at the federal level. And, you know, we know that the, the federal government spends however they choose, sort of, um, or we wouldn't be trillions of dollars in, in debt. Right. Um, but it's not, it's not, uh, it's one of those things where if we, if we can't substantiate how many people we have living in Colorado, it, we just simply don't get the money. Mm -hmm. And so that's the unfortunate part is, um, I mean, it really does make a difference to have as many people counted as possible, mm -hmm. because that just means that, that that'll be less money that we have to come up from with from our general fund. Um, and again, this is something that we're not talking about like one year. When the state does their budget, it's one year at a time. For the census, it's a 10-year plan. Mm -hmm. So people need to understand the importance that this is not something that we just lose out on year one. We don't get the money, you know, year two, year three, year four, year five, mm -hmm. year up until the next census. And so that's why the fact that it's every 10 years is such a big deal. Yeah. Thank you. That's, yeah, thank you. I really appreciate that. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, and Shannon, if you, um, yeah, I didn't even realize you were on here. Hi, Shannon. Um, so if anybody has attended, like, um, you know, feel free, if anybody has attended um, any other trainings, I know that some people are attending, you know, multiple trainings. I'm going to try to attend another one soon. Um, just because every time you go through one, um, you know, you learn something new and you, uh, the, you know, the talk is focused on something different. So if anybody has information that they can share for my blind spots, then like by all means, um, I, I would love that. So thank you very much, Shannon. That's uh, something I was wondering about the other day. So yay, now we know. Okay, great. Anybody else? Okay. All right. So moving on to the next slide then. Oops. There we go. Okay. So some considerations, right? And again, this is where I'm trying to like uh, dance the dance of trying to figure out like what is um, beneficial, what's good general information and what's um, good specific information. So, um, so each of them obviously have their advantages and disadvantages. So I really would encourage you to consider sort of troubleshooting um, or brainstorming uh, for um, poor and with uh, the folks who you are connected to. Um, so, and we'll, we'll get to this in just a moment, but one thing that I, I would really encourage you to do, I found it um, really beneficial. I will, <clears throat> um, uh, there's a hyperlink included here in a bit for the, um, the actual census questionnaire, which is very easy to find, like it's just on the census website. Um, and, but I didn't realize that they were being so transparent about it. Um, so one of the trainings that I went to, um, they had them printed out for everybody. And at first I glanced over it and I was like, oh, I can do this. Like, I don't really have any questions. I don't think this seems pretty straightforward. And then they actually, as part of the exercise, um, if uh, I, I would like to be doing this with you all, um, as part of the exercise, they actually had us sit down and fill it out as if we were filling it out for our families. And sure enough, I popped up with multiple questions. Um, one section actually made me really angry um, because I felt like I couldn't properly represent um, some of my child's experiences. Um, anyway, so I definitely encourage you to sit down and you know, even if you don't have the ability to um, print it out or whatever, right? Sit down um, <clears throat> with the form online or on your phone or whatever and think through how you would answer it or um, your stakeholders or sit down with your stakeholders, your community members and see um, what you think, right? And so the, the version that you can find online right now I hope this isn't confusing. So the version that I'm talking about is a PDF that's made available through the census that is, um, you know, a PDF of the print version that people will receive in the mail. Okay. Um, so it is not what the online version will look like. And as far as I know, the telephone version is the one that is most mysterious right now. So obviously, um, no matter which version you're taking, 
um, or which format in which you're taking the census, um, uh, the questions will be the same. But as I'm about to point out, um, yeah, there are certain pros and cons to each one. So um, for example, and uh, yeah, for example, race is, um, sorry, uh, race is one of the questions that is asked. So on a paper form, um, you can check multiple boxes. If you are multiracial or um, you, know, you have multiple ethnicities that are significant to you, heritage that is significant to you, then on paper form, you can check all the boxes that you want. You can check <laughs> every box, right? And a uh, fun fact, um, in 2010, the most uh, common prevalent race was multiracial. So, um, but yeah, you, on the paper form, you can check all the boxes you want, but you don't have very much space to write in detail. Um, so you've got just like, you know, the little boxes, right? Um, there's not a lot of space to write in detail. Um, but if you go online and writing in your answer, right, might be significant to you. If you go online, you're only allowed to check one box, but then you have, I believe it's 200 characters to write in whatever you want to write in. And they do take that into consideration. So that's just a really brief example, um, but something to consider if the people that you are, you know, working with, reaching out to, have multiple um, ways to access the census that you might want to um, talk with them about. Um, yes, you can skip questions uh, on the paper form. You can skip questions. It's not like the scantrons when you know, some of us were kids or whatever. Um, it doesn't throw out your answers if you turn in your paper form and there are skipped questions. Likewise, um, my understanding is that you are able to proceed through the on, <clears throat> excuse me, the online version of the census. Um, uh, excuse me, with without. Um, why am I tongue tied? Sorry. Uh, you can skip through questions and the online version will let you proceed to the next question, even if you ha haven't answered um, previous questions. Um, so having said that, make sure you don't accidentally skip a question. Um, but of course, we are encouraging everybody, um, the census is encouraging everybody to answer as completely and fully as possible. Um, so any questions there? Okay, next slide. All right, so let's start talking about some of the specific uh, populations that I anticipate that many of us will be working with. Again, this is, um, it's really hard to be comprehensive. Um, and uh, yeah, so feel free to contact me if I haven't approached some of the information that you'd like to know um, or send it in the chat. I can check the chat in a moment. Um, and, uh, or, you know, and if I don't know the answer, then I'll, I'll put you in touch with the right people who will know. Um, so, um, urban, rural, and tribal areas will be contacted differently. All right. So as we all know, many households across Colorado do not have reliable mail service, internet connectivity, and a lot of communities use PO boxes as a primary form of mail collection. I, reiterate, I'll, I'll point this out again in a moment, but PO boxes will not receive, um, will not receive uh, an invitation to participate in the mail. So um, yeah, we can talk about that in, in a moment because that makes things very tricky. Uh, but the census is based on addresses. It is based on residences. It is not based on people. It does not like the search or the, the information from the Census Bureau does not go out based on your name. Okay, um, any questions right now about that? Let me look at the chat. Okay, ah, there we go. Thank you, Shannon, okay, all right. Um, thank you, yeah. So Shannon says, if people skip questions, it may mean a census worker comes to, uh, to your home to follow up. This is why we suggest filling it in completely, yes, yes. Uh, and Marlene asks, did I hear you correctly in that we should be getting out uh, uh, a form in three weeks by mail? Um, yes and no. <laughs> we'll talk about that in the timeline. Um, some people will, some people will not. Information about the census, widely speaking, will go out in, in about three weeks, yes. Um, but whether you get the paper form or an invitation, we'll talk about that in a moment. Okay. So um, yeah, urban, rural, and tribal areas will be contacted differently. So let's start breaking that down a little bit. Um, whoops, sorry. 
Here we go, next slide. All right, urban and suburban areas. So you will receive a letter in the mail. I'm just gonna read this word for word. Um, a letter in the mail from the US Census Bureau with an invitation to respond or a letter in the mail from the US Census Bureau and a paper form, okay? Um, so if you decide, so that's for urban and suburban areas. So if you decide to go ahead and fill out the paper form and it comes with a self-addressed stamped envelope so you don't have to worry about, you know, getting postage on it or whatever. Um, if you receive a paper form, if you wanna do it that way, great, go ahead, fill it out. Um, you may also receive, and you know what? Actually, this was not a clear distinction. I apologize. I don't know what the difference is, actually. I'm just realizing this. I don't know what the difference is between um, like how they make the decision to send you either a letter in the mail or a letter in the mail inviting you and a paper form. I really don't know. Does anybody know that answer? I will check here on the chat or speak up. Nope. Okay, darn. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, it's just occurring to me. I want to say I have a vague memory in my head that if it is an area that is commonly Spanish speaking, that you will receive both um, the paper form and the invitation, but do not quote me on that. That's interesting. Okay. Um, so the paper form is just the paper form, right? Like that is just what it is, you can send it in. The letter in the mail, and this is part of misinformation that's been going around, or not maybe misinformation, definitely confusion. So um, you do not need, I'm sorry, excuse me. Uh, the, the, the invitation will give you a 12 digit code that is tied to your residence, right? Um, so it's a way for the Census Bureau um, to automatically tie the response to the address. So if you get this 12 digit code in the mail on paper, then you jump onto your laptop and you go to the Census Bureau, um, then uh, you enter this 12 digit code and the um, system automatically knows to pair that code and your information with your address or the address that that code was sent to, okay? Um, however, you don't need your unique code to respond to the census. So for example, and I probably will do this, the day that the census goes live, right, I will probably be jumping on my computer the, that second, right, uh, and um, uh, logging in using my address, right? But I am also fortunate that I live in an urban area where I have constant internet access and I am not a transient person. I have, um, I live in one place with to other people constantly in my life is very consistent that way. A lot of people do not have that um, privilege or advantage or those circumstances, right? So um, that's where we get a little hairier. All right, any questions before I move on to more rural areas? Okay, and then when we talk about the timeline, we'll talk about like, okay, so what happens if I just decide to ignore this 12 digit code? What happens if I'm just like, eh, I'm too busy right now as things often go, right? And you're like, oh my God, I meant to fill out the census three weeks ago, right? So what happens? Um, my 12 digit code is sitting on my kitchen counter with dust on it. So we'll talk about that in a moment when we get to the timeline. Okay, so next, sorry, there we go. Next slide. Let's talk about rural areas for a minute. Um, so if you live in a rural area, including most Colorado mountain communities, the San Luis Valley, and the Eastern Plains, please note that the Census Bureau will not send letters, post, excuse me, postcards or mail forms, <clears throat> mail forms to PO boxes, right? So maybe, <laughs> and this is like directly from uh, the, Actually, I pulled this language from the Together We Count training that I went to. Um, so, okay, so depending on where you live, you might, you know, if you get regular mail service and you have an address, um, a traditional uh, address, then you may receive a letter in the mail encouraging you to go online, or you may receive a letter, uh, oh, sorry, this is not terribly clear. You may receive a letter encouraging you to go online in addition to a mail paper form, just like we talked about in urban areas, right? Or a Census Bureau worker may drop off and leave materials at your household between these two dates. Later on in this um, webinar, I will talk about um, 
uh, ensuring that you um, that you can verify that a census worker is a, a legitimate Census Bureau worker. Okay, so that's for rural areas. Um, and I have some more advice there in a moment too on working with folks who do really only have PO boxes. That's also something that I am more than happy to talk to you about in terms of outreach strategies, if that's where your concern is um, in really isolated remote areas, like please, 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 let's let's chat on the phone or um, uh, online. Okay. Reservations in Colorado. This is again a much trickier situation um, that I am I only know so much about, right? So uh, if I can't answer your questions, I am also happy again to help find the resources for you. So <laughs> again, it all depends on the kind of residence you have and the kinds of addresses that you have. So you'll see a repeat of the information that I just gave about the rural areas, right? You might receive a letter in the mail encouraging you to go online. Um, and I don't think that I included this information in here anywhere. Obviously, the government is gonna push people to go online, right? It's uh, literally less, less paperwork, um, more efficient. And um, for those of you, I did not include this here, but for those of you working with people, or maybe you are one of those yourself, that the idea of having a Census Bureau worker show up at your door is really awful um, for any number of reasons, um, then if you go online, um, at any point during the census recording period, then that system automatically updates. It updates every moment, right? Um, so if somebody was scheduled to come to your house on a Wednesday because you have not responded yet and you respond on, you know, Tuesday night, they're not going to show up at your door. So that's just a little side note to include. But anyway, back to reservations in Colorado, right? So the same options. You might receive information to go online, but as we all know, reservations are not necessarily um, included in, uh, or they don't get regular postal service, right? You might also get that additional mail form or a Census Bureau worker may drop off materials. Again, we can talk about strategies. Um, to help with that because for very obvious reasons, a lot of people living on reservations don't want people from the government showing up at their door. All right, so a little tip here, right? A uh, little information. Even in the most isolated areas, the census has made efforts to locate people, um, particularly those people who are tied to PO boxes, okay? Um, so that has already been put in place. And Martha Mason, I don't think you're on here, but if you're out there, I'll let you know separately. Uh, <laughs> um, she, so Martha Mason works for an organization down in the Durango area. I believe my brain is fuzzy right now. Um, and she was telling me uh, a few weeks ago that people she had been talking to who live in really remote areas um, said that they were seeing census workers um, on their property. And so I talked with people at the census and they explained um, that census workers were out and about physically scouting uh, addresses and residences of all different kinds, but particularly the ones that are really hard to find or might not be tra uh, more traditional or permanent kinds of residences. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> but the process did end in the fall of 2019. So that could be a sign that um, people are, you know, um, um, that people, uh, sorry, <laughs> I got distracted. Um, that could be a sign that maybe somebody is misbehaving, right? Uh, which is important to catch. Um, but yeah, uh, so if they saw somebody back in September, then that might have very well been legit, okay? Um, but right now, not so much. Oh, okay. Uh, Shannon just left the webinar, but uh, okay. I'm just trying to check in the chats now that I uh, now that I, I know more what to anticipate with this. Any questions about this? Is this helpful? I hope. And we'll talk again how to sort of ver verify census workers here in a little bit. Okay. So if you are working, oops, excuse me. Oh wait, sorry, I almost forgot about this. I'm gonna go, we're already, I feel like time is pressing in. So I'm gonna skip 
past this a little bit. Um, I don't think this is shocking information, but for those of you who are more visual learners, or maybe you want to pass this information on to um, your colleagues and communities, um, here is a map of those male contact strategies that I was just discussing. So you can see this map of Colorado, how it is divided into um, uh, you know, the green and the purple here. Um, so the purple then shows, right, like here are, and it makes sense, the purple are mostly urban and suburban areas. Those are the folks who are um, going to be mailed information suggesting that they go online first, right? Um, whereas green uh, hits up the more rural and remote areas. And so um, the census will be sending them both a paper form and a postcard. A postcard to remind them of how to get online that is and then also there is information about bilingual and spanish-speaking folks on here um, so if that's relevant to your interests okay if you are working with people in remote areas i would say and this is just coming from my experience feel free to disagree with me <laughs> if anybody has because i'm not working in remote areas but my understanding through all of this is that perhaps the best way for them to do this, to ensure that they are counted, is to suggest that they do it over the phone. Um, I'm really not trying to make generalizations here, but I did grow up rather country. Uh, a lot of folks don't want government workers. There's a reason they live far away, right? They do not want government workers on their property. So one, the best way to have them not have somebody show up at their door is to have them take it, right? Um, I would assume that the phone system updates, you know, maybe not as quickly as the online, but the phone system would update rather quickly, faster than paper, right? And I assume that most people, and this is a big assumption, but that most people have, um, even when they live very remotely, uh, still a connection to the outside world, which is often a landline, right? So I would say, that is just my own insight, um, to recommend that they complete the census over the phone. So any questions or comments there? Let's check the chat. No, nope, we're good. Okay. All right. So let's move along to some other particular populations. Um, so for transient and or unsheltered people, people experiencing homelessness, um, the census will be visiting people outdoors. Um, so I don't quite know all of the background details on this, which is really starting to frustrate me. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I am uh, busy, busy talking with a variety of um, shelters here in Denver, like the Denver Rescue Mission and the St. Francis Center and other day centers like that to figure out more information about what this looks like on the ground in Denver. Um, but the census is scouting and will be visiting people who live in tent cities, for example, um, in places where they are known to sleep, right? At soup kitchens, at, at shelters, mobile vans, um, that sort of thing. But that is only scheduled to be happening between March 30th and April 1. And I feel like that is a, um, obviously I feel passionate about this one, um, but I feel like that's not nearly a big enough window. Um, so we can talk a little bit more about that, right? If you are working with transient and un unsheltered folks, I would definitely suggest that when you talk to them, um, really emphasizing the impact the census has on their lives, encouraging them to participate by phone, right? Again, there's my irritation with the fact that I can't hand them that phone number right now. Um, but, you know, oftentimes even people who do not have, um, you know, permanent residences do have phones of some kind, right? So um, that is one good way to do it. Um, you might also um, consider doing some of the legwork for unsheltered people. So right now, this is one thing that I'm doing. We are gonna talk about group quarters here in just a moment and enumerators. Um, an enumerator, by the way, is, uh, and many of you might already know this, but an an enumerator is a person that is a census uh, bureau worker, right? One of the door knockers, basically, right? Um, so we'll talk more about that here in a moment when we get to group quarters. Um, but uh, so one thing that is not clear um, about uh, 
how homeless folks are being contacted um, is exactly which shelters are going to be doing what, right? Like to provide them with resources. So that is one thing that I am working on right now so that I can distribute that information to people that I'm just talking to by way of foot traffic, right? Like if I meet you on the side of Colfax and wherever, right? Like I can say, hey, you know, here's why the census is important. Here's some information. Please go to Da, 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 whatever center on the, these dates, like hold on to this card and please go there. This is why it matters, right? Um, you can also contact local libraries to see if they are hosting any specific events or providing additional resources um, in, you know, uh, on top of just their, um, excuse me, their usual uh, computers, right, and available technology to see if they're doing anything to encourage folks who have limited access, not just people who are experiencing homelessness, right, but people who just generally don't have access to the internet, if those local libraries are doing anything um, specific to help. Um, before I, <laughs> this was kind of an afterthought if you can't tell, um, but I do want to make this brief note about children as a special population. Um, I wish I could remember some of the statistics I've heard, um, but they are one of the most undercounted populations. Uh, I think that there's just some misinformation out there about um, uh, who should be counted and who should not be. That's why I keep mentioning babies, <laughs> right? Um, so uh, one thing, I th yeah, I think that people just don't know um, if minors, right? Minors are so often left out of the um, national conversation. Um, and so I think that a lot of people just don't realize that they're supposed to include their small children. So once again, I'll keep saying it, and I believe I'm going to say it again here in a few minutes, even a baby, a brand new baby, baby is born on Tuesday, you fill out the, the census on Wednesday, you include that baby. Um, so, and you can list zero as their age, right? But I mean, one easy way to think about it is just the fact that, you know, you figure that the next time uh, a child that was born today could be counted will be in the year 2030. And, um, you know, uh, it, it's, it's likely that many of the children um, who are, you know, in the next 10 years who could be counted in the census will be using some of those um, very significant public services that we went over a little bit ago. Um, another note that I would make is that if you are working with people um, and children are uh, a, a relevant population for you to Ha suggest to the parents of children that they become very clear about who is going to um, count their child, like quite literally. Um, so uh, apparently another way that children are often overlooked and undercounted is that um, parents who are separated or divorced or whatever um, will just kind of assume that the other you know, parent involved is counting the child. Um, so that, you know, we just shouldn't make assumptions about that. So encourage families to have really clear communication about what they're doing, how they are counting their children. Oh, sorry, gosh. So many words. All right, so let's move on to residents of group quarters. So I, I feel like a lot of folks will, um, uh, I know that a lot of our uh, contracting partners are um, really interested in this. And again, this might be a, a time for a phone call or an email separately. Um, group quarters are places where people live. Um, can I move this? Let's see if I can move this. Sorry, I just realized that I could move that. That would have been helpful a while ago. Uh, <laughs> oh, before I jump in, let's see what the chat says. Oh, okay. Thanks, Marlene. <laughs> You're wonderful. Okay. All right. <laughs> Sorry, Marlene had to run away. All right. So uh, back to group quarters. Group quarters are places where people live or stay in a group living arrangement. These places are owned or managed by a third party that provides residents with housing and or services. The Census Bureau assists group, quarter, uh, group quarters administrators in responding to the census on behalf of residents to ensure a complete and accurate census count. So grouping, uh, group quarters include, and I have this whole list and that's like only like half the ones that are listed on the census uh, website, um, but nursing facilities, hospitals, um, who have no usual home elsewhere, 
uh, or excuse me, patients who have no usual home elsewhere, inpatient hospice facilities, college, uh, colleges, universities, um, federal and state prisons, local jails, municipal confinement facilities, correctional residential facilities, uh, residential treatment centers that are non-correctional, group homes that are non-correctional, and psychiatric hospitals and psychi psychiatric units um, that provide long-term non-acute care. That was a, a lot of stuff to list. Um, so uh, I picked and uh, just kind of cherry picked the places that I thought might be most um, pertinent to our folks that might be listening to this webinar. Um, if you would like the complete count, here is the list on this next slide, right? Here's a full list of the group quarters and further information at this website. Um, again, you'll have access to the hyperlink and it's not hard to find. Like um, you can, <laughs> you can honestly uh, just type in group quarters census, right? It's that easy. And again, I'm happy to do that Googling for you or I might be sitting on a bunch of these resources. So don't go recreate the wheel for yourself. Let me, uh, let, let me help. Um, so group quarters administrators should already be working with enumerators, right? Um, this should already be like, so any of the folks who are administration in any of the kinds of facilities that I just mentioned should already be working and should have been working um, already with census workers. Mm. So there, there is an individual process for each kind of, um, I mean, similar, obviously, but nuanced processes for each kind of facility. So clearly, you know, um, that's too specific for this um, webinar. Um, <laughs> but yeah, um, uh, so please contact me if you have any questions. Um, but basically, those should be taken care of, right? Like even though so many people who live um, and have services through group quarters, uh, um, even though so many of them are considered quote unquote hard to count, um, they should be taken care of. They should be counted accurately. Um, so having said that, um, which that makes our jobs easier if we're doing outreach, right? Um, having said that, <clears throat> there are these very strange um, sort of hybrid facilities that I don't quite understand how they work still. And I'm really having a hard time getting information even from the census about that. Um, so for example, <clears throat> moving down the slide, I'm doing outreach with the Denver Rescue Mission, right? And so far I've been doing a lot of just on foot um, outreach to people who come and use their services. Denver Rescue Mission has, mm, I believe two residential locations, a couple of day centers, and then like a drop-in possibly. Anyway, they're a strange hybrid of different kinds of organizations. So right now, I think, I think we're just in, we're, we're continuing to email. I think that they have an enumerator coming um, and really doing the bulk of the work there. Uh, however, especially for some of their, you know, non-residential locations and services, I am trying to figure out what I can do for them um, in terms of providing uh, education um, and encouraging those folks who might not live with them full time to please be present. You know, here is when the enumerator is coming. Um, here is when we can expect to have resources for you. Please, please, please come get services on these days, right? So that's something that you can do. Um, and if you are particularly interested in working with a specific facility or a population and you discover that for some reason they, you know, it seems like based on this information that they should have a, uh, an enumerator um, connected to them, uh, but they don't, please be in contact with me and I will get you to the correct person at the census to make sure that that process gets going. Okay. Um, all right. Just checking in on the chats. Okay. Oh, sorry. All right. Um, <laughs> I'm, it's just so much information. All right. I, I really wanted some time for Q and A at the end and I'm not quite sure that we're going to have it, but again, like I'm, I'm available. Uh, we can stay on and chat here. Um, if you're needing to go in the next few minutes, cause we only have 15 minutes left. If you need to go, then feel free to post a question on the chat. Um, I will also mention right now, even though it's you know available to you elsewhere, my email is L as in Lacey Stein S T E I N at ccdconline.org. So feel free to shoot me any emails. Um, yeah, in case we don't have a lot of time for questions. 
Okay, so now that we have been talking about how census workers are contacting people, let's go ahead and talk about the timeline. Um, all right. So, um, okay. Sorry, I'm going to take a drink of water. <laughs> okay. So as you can see, um, uh, right now we are currently in February still, right? Uh oh, sorry, excuse me. Um, <laughs> we are currently in Jan or February still, right? So this is considered the pre-census promotion time period. I actually just in the last couple of days have started seeing um, television commercials, right? Providing information, which is great and wonderful. But again, if you're doing outreach like me, that is um, oftentimes more directed at, you know, more general public. Um, so I think there's still a fair amount of work to do in terms of, um, you know, our specific communities. Um, so March 12th is when all this stuff starts happening, right? So March 12th is the actual census start. Um, so this is when the census starts to the census bureau starts to go through the post office and send letters of invitation those um the, the postcards that i was discussing right um to respond uh this is also when the online and phone portal um means of response will open right so it would be really cool if you know we could have the information like the telephone number even a few days before that, but I, I don't know that information yet. So, um, all right. So basically this is when, yeah, you can respond online, you can respond on the phone, and then you'll start to get that information in the mail. I believe too, that if you are one of those populations who will be getting both a postcard and the paper form, I believe that like that is also when all of that goes out. So it's not just the postcards that get sent out that day to start reminding people and inviting people. It's also those paper forms for communities like rural areas and things um, that uh, um, will need multiple ways of accessing the census to ensure their participation. Um, then we have the dates uh, for homeless populations, right? The 30th, 31st, and 1st that I mentioned. April 1 is official census day. So this, I think, sounds a little confusing. Um, but essentially, census day does not mean it's not like election day, right? Or, um, you know, the day that you have to go vote. Um, April 1 is a reference point, okay? Um, so even if you fill this out in May, right, um, April 1 serves as a reference point to talk about your family or your household, excuse me, not necessarily family, but your household um, and who is living with you at that time and where you are living, okay? That'll make a little bit more sense when we talk about uh, filling out the actual census. I should also, well, I'll make that side note in a moment, sorry. Um, so April 8th through 16th then, so paper forms will be sent out to households if they have not yet responded. So if the phone system and the online system and you know the mail too, obviously some paper uh, forms will be um, accounted for at that point, right? If they, if the government has not received your information, if the Census Bureau has not received your information, then uh, paper forms start to get sent out, right? Like regardless of where you are living, you start to get paper forms in the mail. April 2020, that's when group quarters are counted, which we just hit upon. And then April, like when we get to the end of April, that's when the final uh, postcard will be sent out to remind people, right? And then the door knocking phase begins. It's also called the non-response follow-up period, okay? So everybody can still respond online by paper and by phone, um, but if the government hasn't heard from you over the course of the two months, right, from March 12th to May 13th, lots of time for everybody to take it, then that's when you can expect that somebody could be coming and knocking on your door. Or as Shannon mentioned in the chat earlier, that if you did not complete your census uh, to the fullest extent, then um, uh, you might be getting some follow-up uh, from an actual census worker. 
So though this does not seem maybe as intuitive as it could be, <laughs> I maybe should have mentioned this earlier, this webinar is really more about like, right, like, like the specifics of how people can take it and access it as opposed to um, the census, as opposed to like, this is what the census looks like. Um, because I am not actually allowed um, per our grant money um, to help people with the taking of the census. Um, so my focus has really been on um, um, providing uh, solid information about access and uh, what people can expect and that sort of thing, right? Um, as opposed to like, let's sit down and take the census because I am by law not allowed to sit down and help people take the census, but I will be giving you some information. So um, once again, the census, moving on to the next slide, which uh, is about defining what a household is, okay? So again, the census is, and I haven't emphasized this actually very much, the census is not about your personal data. Like it, it is, but it's not. Like the purpose of the census is to gather aggregate data, um, large pools of data, not to, try and pick out one person and understand that one person and what's going on in their life. They want to know what we're doing as households. They want to know what we're doing, not by name, but by where we are living, right? So I, I hope that makes sense. Please, please chime in if that's odd. And <laughs> hopefully as we move through the next few slides, it'll become a, a little more, uh, it will make a little bit more sense. Um, so they are interested, the census is in interested in your household right? A household consists of all the people who occupy a single living quarter and consider themselves a unit within that space, okay? A house, an apartment, or any other group of rooms can constitute a household, all right? I hope that in your head you're applying that as you need to thinking about um, yourself, your neighbors, your situation, your stakeholders, your communities, right? Again, there are way too many um, possibilities to um, and combinations of people and the way that we live these days. Um, there's no such thing really as a traditional unit, right? Um, considering all the different ways we live. So it's a, it's a lot to consider. And again, one reason that I would encourage you to sit down and even if you're not putting paper to pen, um, you know, sit down online if at all possible and think about how will I fill this out, which we'll get to that in just a moment. So here are the questions on the form. It's really simple, honestly, like it really is. Um, if you were a single person, which I have, I have many in this day and age, you know, not very many, uh, not as many people getting married and making babies, right? So if uh, you're one of my single girlfriends who's buying her own home, um, this, this could take like three minutes, right? Um, so, uh, okay. So they are going to ask you 10 questions. They're going to ask your address. Um, they're going to ask your, um, and, and again, the address, that is one thing that I need to follow up on in terms of transient, um, folks and some other people might be wondering the same thing, right? Um, so I need to follow up on that for myself, actually. Um, so how many people live in your household? Okay. Um, this is our only chance, it says, for 10 years to ensure that we have an accurate count of where everyone is on April 1. So again, that just serves, it's kind of an arbitrary but easy to remember date so that everybody just has the same shared, excuse me, the same shared date um, for uh, reference, right? Do you own or rent your home? Question number three, right? Um, and that also helps, that data is also helped, uh, helps to um, provide uh, funding for housing assistant programs, right? And to enforce fair housing laws. Your name, okay? But notice not your social security number. Notice there's no information here about citizenship, no question. Um, it, uh, uh, excuse me, it asks your telephone number and it says that that is a backstop in case a Census Bureau um, worker needs to contact you to clarify a response, right? Um, the sex, uh, and you can only choose, and I have a lot of friends that are very frustrated by this because I do have a lot of connections to the LGBTQ community, you can only choose male or female, which is pretty frustrating. 
Um, so date of birth and age is the next question. Um, again, uh, well, we'll talk about that in a moment. And then Hispanic origin. Once again, though, it does not ask about citizenship. Race. Remember the different options, depending on which portal you take the um, census through. And then your relationships. This is where it can get a little bit like complicated to explain, right? Depending on how many people are living with you and what your relationships are. I know that there is space for gay and lesbian relationships to be reported, um, which is again important to some of my community members. Um, but it gives you space to talk about whether you're married, single, divorced, widowed, separated, blah, 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 so on and so forth. And to explain like I am living currently with my um, mother's brother, you know, my maternal uncle, right? Whatever the case might be. Um, you know, even if you don't have uh, custody of your cousin's daughter, but for whatever reason your cousin's daughter is living with you, you can explain that. Um, and then two, let's move on to this next slide. Um, this might sound, and I apologize, I was afraid that this was going to be too much information. It's so much information. Uh, so I will be running over just a little bit. Those of you who need to go, I completely understand. Um, forgive me for uh, running over on time. Um, uh, again, this will be recorded and I'll send it out to you all. I'll try to keep it try to wrap up by 2.35. And again, though, if you want to stick around and, and be on chat, then we can, uh, we can do that to answer any questions that you've got. Okay, so, um, all right. Um, more than one household, in other words, some just additional important understandings um, that may or may not be relevant to folks you work with. So more than one household, or you can think of this like unit, unit of people or family unit or whatever, right, can occupy a single structure. Um, I have emphasized the second point to be clear, the census is conducted by address, not name an individual. So keep in mind this third point here, um, six months and a day. So, oops, I'm sorry, <laughs> six months and a day. So this is the rule, it's a quick and easy way to think about, like say, and I talked to people during my outreach saying, you know, um, we live in rural, uh, we have two residences. We live, we rent an apartment in rural Colorado because that's where we love, that's where, that's home. But we also rent a small place in the city because that is where my disabled child needs to come for services. So the rule there, is you can think about where you're living. So you, you would pick one, one, say that you have two residences, right? Then you will get two um, sets of information in the mail, but you don't wanna be overcounted, right? So one way to think about it is which residence, like if I spend six months in one place, six months in the other place, you know, which one do I wanna call my primary residence? So I'm not being overcounted. Um, so uh, let's just pick one, right? Or maybe you actually spend six months and a day in one residence and five months and 27 days or whatever, right, um, in the other residence. That's an important question too for a lot of folks who um, maybe are divorced and share custody of their kids. Or maybe they're, you know, they live with their elderly mother to take care of her part of the year and part not, right? So where, you know, say I'm the caretaker of my elderly mother, I have my own place, but I'm usually with my mom, right? If I'm usually with my mom, if I'm there for seven months of the year or six months in a day, then I will use my mother's residence to log my information, okay? When you, moving on, and I am hurrying a little bit, moving on, person one, like if you look online and if you look at the paper form, it's going to say, give you spaces for um, multiple people, right? Person one can be anybody, okay? So, and that just lists them off as person one, person two, person three, right? And then it will start asking you in that relationship section, like, so what is person one's relationship to person two, to person three, two, right? And so on and so forth. Person one can be anybody. It could be your six-year-old kid, right? Um, it doesn't matter. Like that just, it's just arbitrary. It's just a way of identifying people and keeping information straight. Um, for brand new babies, use zero as their age. <laughs> and I have um, really covered that citizenship question. Okay, and so when you guys get this, uh, when I send you this PowerPoint, you will have a hyperlink to the actual 
um, questionnaire that like the, the PDF of the paper questionnaire that will be sent out. Okay. Um, and again, like you can access that really easily. I think that if you uh, just type that into Google, you know, as um, the 2020 census paper form or something like that, right, it'll pop right up. Oh, okay. All right. So I am going to um, cover this again very quickly to be mindful of our time. Um, but one big thing, right, for uh, particularly for a lot of elderly folks, but for anybody right now, again, in this political climate, there is so much distrust of so many different facets of the government. The, and I am not the most trusting of our government, actually, but I feel good about the census. I really do. Um, and, and so the next couple of slides will cover why, okay? So it is flat out against the law for any Census Bureau employee to disclose or publish any census information that identifies an individual, okay? Period. Um, and uh, yeah, they take a lifelong pledge of confidentiality. And if they violate that, they get fined up to $250,000 and can be prisoned um, for up to five years or both of those things. <laughs> um, furthermore, and this is very important in terms of, yes, the census does ask for your name. I'm not quite sure why they do that, frankly. That's just occurring to me. I don't really know why they do that. Um, but your information cannot be accessed by any other government agency and cannot be used against you, period, um, uh, by any government agency or law enforcement agency. Um, yeah, period. It cannot be pulled. And this is the third bit here, right? So the algorithm that the Census Bureau uses is literally, it buries personal information. It is, once again, the census is a tool to collect aggregate huge pools of data to figure out things like these massive budgets, right, um, for uh, public services across all the states. It is not used to send ICE agents to your house or to have you arrested for a crime, okay? Um, a, a really, it's a quick anecdote, so I'll share it because I think it's really powerful. Um, apparently, after 9-11, the Bush administration, some government agency actually tried to hack into the census uh, information because they were hoping to track down people who might be Muslim. Um, and those people went to prison. <laughs> they, A, could not hack into the information like they were not able to. They got caught trying to hack into the information and they went to prison. Okay, so if you have folks who are particularly not trusting of the government, understandably, then feel free to share this with them. Okay, and there are lots of um, uh, flyers and information that I can send you uh, that you could print off um, or distribute digitally um, to, uh, you know, assure people. So this is kind of a repeat, but just a, a sample too of what I can send you, right? Um, this little logo, the census is safe and secure, Title 13 states um, that uh, the census data may only be used to produce statistics, okay? And individual data is locked up by the Census Bureau for 72 years. <laughs> so that's the average life um, expectancy, right? So, okay. Um, I am going to barely touch on this because we are so out of time, um, but I did want to point out that when I send this information to you, you can feel free to use these next couple of slides to discuss with your folks um, misinformation and disinformation, right? Um, and then there are lots, and once again, this is something you can easily Google, but I'm happy to provide it for you. Um, there are lots of resources out there about how to verify a census worker. And if you go onto the census website, um, you know, census.gov, um, then they will provide you with lots of resources to help assure yourself or to other people, right, like in your community, about how to verify that somebody is working for the census, okay? Um, let's get past that and just spend one moment. I did include here at the end of our slides just some um, common persuasive messages that could help you depending on, you know, if you are trying to convince others to participate in the census. Um, here are just some good, quick little blips 
that you can share some good messaging or language if you're producing materials, that kind of thing. Um, that can you know that are all designed to appeal to slightly different interests so um, the census fund services i need i matter and the census allows me to be heard a lot of communities are seeing the census as <clears throat> not a, a means of surveillance but as an act of resistance so that's something that i think is really important um, the census is good for my community and i help my community by participating the census is important for children. By participating, I help today's children and future generations. Uh, participating is my civic duty. And then participating is convenient. Remember, it should only take about 10 minutes and there's multiple ways to do it. And 10 minutes equals lots of dollars over 10 years. So, okay. All right, that's all I got. Here is all kinds of info, ways that you can reach me outside of this webinar so that I can send you not just this, um, I'll send you the recording and the actual slideshow itself. Again, feel free to distribute it and use it as you want. Um, it is here for the sharing. Um, yeah, and uh, um, I will also send uh, a, a nice little um, resource, um, digital resources uh, to your inbox. Thank you all so much. Thank you all for being here. I really hope that this was helpful. Um, yeah, and uh, happy census season. <laughs> Thank you all. Mm -hmm.